Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. Welcome to Life on Maine, and I'll be one of the first to wish you a very happy Valentine's Day. I can really think of no better place to be on a day like this than to be gathering together with God's people and focusing on the greatest love that has ever been shown to man. And as we get ready to go into our time of worship through song today, I want to draw our attention to Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 1, going through verse 7. Because I think this gives us great picture as we consider the day that we're in and the fact that we get to come to give our worship to the author of love himself, the one whose very character, Scripture tells us, is love. And it starts off there in verse 1, Ephesians chapter 2, saying this, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom, of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But, and I love this news, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. And that would be the days we're living in now. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by work, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. What great news for us today, as we prepare to worship, that we were sinners. We have all fallen away. We all tend to live after the desires of the flesh. But in this is love that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to get straightened out. He came and died. But he didn't only die and show us the Father's love. It tells us there he has made us alive with Christ. And he has seated us, raised us up with Christ, seating us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. We have the promise of an eternity with a lover of our souls who will love us from now throughout the ages. And we in turn also will love him. When the hands of the enemy are bound and nothing but God's righteousness remains. Hallelujah. So let us uh, go into that place of prayer before we go into worship. Lord, we thank you today that you are the lover of our souls, that you did not wait for us to love you but you chose to love us. You chose to give yourself for us and to raise us up. You did everything that we could not do to make it possible for us to be back in right relationship. We thank you for that today. We come here this great Valentine's Day to be able to admonish that we love you and we receive the love that you have shown to us. Now, Lord, as we go through the rest of this time today, would you be glorified in, an ev in everything that takes place through our song, through the reading of your word, through the preaching of the word today? Do a mighty work within as we lift up our praise and our adoration to you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Let us take this next period of time just to lift up our songs of praise to the Lord our God. 
Good morning to you all. Happy Valentine's Day. Today is the day we talk about love. I like to talk about love because we know God, the creator and the designer of love. Today, let's make sure we give love to others, but let's not forget to give love back to the one who started it all. Let's take a few moments to sing to him, telling him you love him. Think about the words you're singing. Let him hear your heart. Let the Holy Spirit use this time to bring sweet harmony between you and God.
Richly bless you today and welcome to Life on Main. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we come to you today to worship and adore you as our God and the Creator, our Redeemer, our Savior, and our Father and Friend. Lord, it is our intention today to bring you glory and honor. Lord, may your glory pour out of heaven over the whole earth and your name be of great renown as your glory floods the earth. Lord, may we as your people do our bidding to assist that revelation of your glory, Lord, both in our words and our deeds. And your name be lifted up. Your son will be esteemed among all people. And many will come into your kingdom as sons and daughters of 
the great Father of heaven. Father, we just glorify your name today out of the depths of our hearts. Lord, may every part of the service today, from the music to the words to the prayers, everything that is done and said bring you glory today, Lord. May you, the music elevate our esteem of you, Lord, as God. May your word build us up Encourage us and help us as we attempt to do your, your, your calling upon us. Bless our pastor as he comes. May the words that flow out of his mouth enter our hearts and our minds. And may we receive them in, indeed in the spirit that they are given. Father God, may they be your words. May the thoughts be your thoughts, and we will in turn praise and glorify the name of God. We pray all these things, expecting things, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's read Luke 15, 1 through 10. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. If you'll take out your Bibles, we are going to be back in 1 Corinthians this morning as we continue our discussion about credible Christianity. Today, we are going to have one verse that we're going to be looking at out of this chapter. We're going to be looking at a number of scriptures, but I want us to look mostly at just one verse out of this passage. Because I think there's so much in it, even though it's such a short verse. He's calling us to be an authentic imitation. Seeming at first that these things are almost opposed to each other. But hopefully by the time we're done, you will see where we are going with this and what we mean by it. The truth is, is that the word imitation actually has three distinct meanings. And we're going to be covering those. And... As we do, let's first look at 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, where the Apostle Paul says this, Imitate me, just as I also imitate Christ. As I said, the word imitation actually has three very distinct meanings, each of which actually has a very significant spiritual application. But the first definition for the word imitation is to be an artificial likeness that is insincere. Probably one of the best examples of this would be counterfeit money. It's an imitation of something that is genuine, but the imitation is created to be deceptive. See, there's a concerted effort in trying to deceive others into thinking that it's genuine, whether it be counterfeit money, whether it's fake jewels, that's probably one that we are more engaged in. Uh, watches, it could be purses, handbags that have a name that's almost like that of a name brand. Individuals who follow this course, if we think about the personal application, 
we would probably coin these individuals, as, especially in the church, as being hypocrites. People that are trying to give off a persona that they are something that they really are not, nor do they have any desire to be. Biblical examples of this would obviously be the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the chief priests, right? The scribes. Especially when they attempted to trap Jesus. I think of Luke chapter 20, verses 19 through 26, and, and we have this account. It says, the chief priests and the scribes that very hour sought to lay hands on him, meaning Jesus. But they feared the people, for they know or knew he had spoken this parable against them. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended or imitated to be righteous. They tried to come off as a fake of the real thing. Why? That they might seize on his words in order to deliver him to the power and the authority of the governor. It wasn't trying to imitate Christ to look like him. It wasn't trying to imitate religious leaders because they wanted to um, achieve or become as such. They were trying to simply be deceptive to entrap. How they do this? It says that they then asked him, saying, Teacher... We know that you say and teach rightly, and you do not show personal favoritism, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? It tells us, though, he perceived their craftiness. Jesus knew their hearts. Jesus was able to look beyond their words to see the intent of their hearts and their spirits. He perceived their craftiness and said to them, Why do you test me? Another example that we see of this counterfeit uh, Christianity, if you will, is in Judas. In John chapter 6, verses 68 and 69, Simon Peter makes a statement, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then what we see is that Judas had fooled Peter into believing he was as devout as all the rest of them were. Where shall we go, right? He encompassed all of them together. But Jesus was prompt to let Peter know something here. And that being that Judas was a devil. Uh, consider the verses that follow, verses 70 and 71. Jesus answered them, did I not choose you? In other words, making it very clear, you did not choose me. I chose you, the 12. And one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. And now we could get into a great big long discussion about whether, you know, Judas was always a counterfeit, or did he become one later on? And that's really uh, not re relevant. What is relevant is that he became a counterfeit. When all was said and done, he wasn't living according to Jesus. He wasn't striving to live his life after the ways of Christ. He was more interested in seeing his will performed, seeing his pockets lined with cash, than he was about following Jesus. See, sometimes we can start off well, but somewhere along the line, something happens in our hearts and we become hypocritical. We, we begin to take on more of the desires of the flesh than we do that of following Christ. And this is at least, at very least, what happened to Judas. He became a counterfeit disciple. He was simply going through the motions, but down in his very heart was to get what he could get out of this dynamic. And unfortunately, I think there's a lot of Christians like that. We like to look spiritual. We like to look like we're walking the walk. But down the very fabric of our hearts is this counterfeit that really it's not about wanting to follow Christ. It's just about what we can get out of the relationship of, with Jesus. It's getting our get out of hell free card. It's not really about living like Jesus. And so we need to make sure that we are living a life that is pleasing to him. 
So that is the first type of imitation. The kind of imitation that is insincere. It's counterfeit. The second type of imitation is an artificial likeness that is genuine. Now, with this type of imitator, whether it's a person or a thing, there's no effort to deceive anybody. It makes it clear that it is not the real thing. We have some of these things in our society. We have things, artificial sweeteners like Splenda or Stevia that will come across and they don't have the word sugar on them. They identify, we are an artificial sweetener, but we will still sweeten. You know, we, we, can, we can act like sugar, but we are not sugar and we're making it very clear. Artificial flowers are another great example. Artificial lighting, when we turn on a light bulb in our house, it doesn't claim to be the sun, right? And we, but we know that it still gives light in the midst of darkness. We have a number, again, of types of this in Scripture. One of these was Diotrephes. Consider the Apostle John's stern statement about this proud hypocrite in the early church. He says in 3 John, verses 9 and 10, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds which he does, prating against us with malicious words. And not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren, and forbids those who wish to, and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. Now, in this situation, unlike the hypocrites that were uh, that Jesus was dealing with, who were striving to to be uh, men of God. This man is just doing things that are very contrary to Scripture and is raising up um, a people to himself. It is a uncovert type of imitation that was going on here. He was being malicious, and anyone that knew Paul's writings or knew the teachings of, of the Scriptures knew that the life that he was living was not godly. The third type of imitation is this. It's to follow after a pattern, a model, or example with an intent to copy or to strive to copy. The, the, the word in the uh, times of Jesus would have been disciple. And th again, this was not a Christian term. This was a term that was used even in the workaday world. It, it was to understand that I am not my master teacher. But what I'm going to do is I want to learn this trade. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come underneath them. I'm going to be a disciple. I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to convince people that I am him. And, and I know I'm going to have some time that I'm going to fall short of where he is. But my desire is to be a learner, a constant learner, so that every moment that I live, as I continue to practice this trade, I will become more and more like my master teacher. And this is where we as the church really need to be. And this is really what Paul was commissioning us to live. Now, like the second type of imitation, this one does not try to convince people that they are the real deal. And, but, but this takes a, a, a better step. There's not a... a uh, trying to bring people alongside into one's way of thinking, there's an understanding that I am the one to be taught. I, I am the one that is in lack. I am the one who needs to be in a receiving mode here to be able to become more and more like another. It's to revere another so much. It, it, it's almost to adore. And dare we even use the phrase worship, in a sense, that master teacher to the point that we're willing to fashion our entire lives after them. This is what Paul was saying when he said, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. And he said that in Ephesians 5, verse 1. It's just as much as he said it here in this passage in 1 Corinthians 11. So, how do we imitate Christ? 
Well, Peter tells us this in 1 Peter verses chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. He says, but as he who called you is holy, and who's the one who called us? That would be Christ, through his Holy Spirit. As he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. In other words, in all your behaviors, in everything you do, everything you say, everything you exhibit with your life. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. This is our number one call as believers. All, the, all these discussions we're having on Credible Christianity ultimately comes down to this, holiness. It's reflecting Christ in everything that we do. It's not reading scriptures and taking what we like and discarding what we don't like. It, it's not taking the things that we understand, the things that we don't understand, to assume that maybe those aren't for today. Either the Bible is true or it's not. It can't be partially true. It's either the, real, the whole deal or it's not. And we as believers need to govern our lives after the ways of Christ, which fulfilled the word of God. Jesus came to fulfill the law. He lived it. We as well need to live like Christ. And how do we live out this holiness? It's not doing the don'ts, and it's doing the do's. Right? It's, bo it's, doing, it's both of those aspects. It's not enough just to say, I don't murder, or I don't steal, or I don't lie. We also have to live our lives in submission to him. We have to live our lives in a way that we serve others. We have to live our lives in a way that we're willing to forgive those that wrong us. We've got to do both. We've got to have both at work in our lives. 1 John 4.16 helps us understand also an aspect of this holiness. And when he said, we will evidence love towards others. He says, and we know and believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. You cannot have a walk with God and hate your brother. You cannot, we, we cannot claim to have a right relationship with the Lord if we are living a life that is contrary to his teachings. Well, this sounds pretty harsh, and it sounds almost kind of uh, hyper-spiritual. Well, maybe it is. Maybe the problem is we, we, we've too much brought God down to our level rather than his people striving to come up to his. And we need to live our lives after him, not fashion him in our likeness. And we have got to be very, very careful of that. God so loved the world. God created us. God had the right to demand of us because of that. We are his possession, but yet we, we chose to wander from him. But yet he still came and he loved us so much that he gave his son for us to bring us back to him. And we need to live our lives accordingly. If we love God and if we want to be imitators of God, we have got to be compassionate in regard to other people. But you, O Lord, Psalm 86, verse 15, you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in mercy and truth. Let me ask you, how are you at those qualities? How are you doing at imitating that? Are you full of compassion for those around you? Are you gracious to others? What's gracious? It's giving them what they don't deserve. Christ gave us what we don't deserve. We deserve death. We deserve eternal torment. But in this is love that God so loved the world, right? How gracious are we to those around us? Long, Christ was long-suffering. Christ was willing to go to the cross for you and for me. He was willing to suffer whatever was necessary to see us come to a saving knowledge of him. Let me ask you, how willing are you to suffer to help lead somebody else in the ways of Christ? And are you abundant as Christ in mercy and in truth? See, we've got to be abundant not only in mercy, but also in truth. See, lots of people can be abundant in mercy, but they let that mercy go to a point of error. And the fact that they have so much mercy on somebody that they don't speak the words of truth to them. The fact they don't call sin, sin anymore. And we need to identify it for what it is. And speak truth, but speak it in mercy and speak it in love. 
If we're going to be like Christ, if we're going to be imitators of Christ, we've got to be willing to forgive. Psalm 86 verse 5, For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive. What does that mean? He's already equipped. He's already prepared himself that there's coming a moment that we're going to do something that's going to require forgiveness. He then doesn't have to go and try to figure out where he will put it down. Did I put it in the closet over here? No, he's ready to forgive. He's got it strapped to his back. And, and when we mess up and when we come to him saying, God, forgive me, he's ready and he is willing to forgive us of our sins right then, right there. Are we able to do the same? Can we say the same towards a brother or sister that has wronged us? Are we ready to forgive? Abundant, overflowing in loving kindness to all who call upon thee. See, if we are going to be imitators of Christ, these are the qualities that are necessary. But can I tell you, there's also another very important aspect to this passage, to this one verse. Because what he is not saying here is simply to be imitators of Christ. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Paul understood first and foremost, it was his call. It was God's call on his life to imitate his Lord, to imitate his Savior. But it didn't stop there. Just as important as that is, it was also important for him to come alongside others, to lead them in the way, and to, to spur them to follow him as he modeled those things of Christ. Because the truth is, there's times in our lives we need to see Jesus with our eyes. And that is impossible until he comes and takes us home. But what he's done is he's given us brothers and sisters in Christ, spiritual mentors that can do just that. Paul was that, and, Paul, and if we are to be imitators of Paul as he imitates Christ, that means we as well must also live that same sort of existence. To realize that it's not just about being holy because God is holy, but it's also being holy so that way our brothers and our sisters in Christ can find, have something healthy and something just and something right of the, of the very image of God before them that they then can walk in. You see, to mentor, in one aspect of the word we could say is like shepherding. Because what the, the way that a shepherd, I don't claim to be a master shepherd. I, you know, I just know what I read. And, I, and I've read a little bit about this. And one thing I know about she shepherds is they're not ranchers. See, what ranchers do, you'll notice, and because you've probably seen the clips, you've seen the movies. How do ranchers deal with their herds? from behind. They drive their herds, but that's not what a shepherd does. A shepherd leads. A shepherd leads the flock. The shepherd sets the example for the flock to follow. And we as Christians are all called, in a sense, to shepherd others. It is, as a shepherd, it is our job to feed. It's our job to protect and care for the sheep. And it is not just the pastor's job. The, the pastor's sheep are those within the church, but each and every single one of us are called to shepherd those relationships that God's entrusted to us. The, the people that he's placed in our lives that are not where we're at spiritually, we have a responsibility to lead the way towards Christ before them. See, a shepherd doesn't go way up away from the sheep. He stays close because the sheep have a tendency to put their face down in the, in the grass and they'll eat themselves off the edge of a cliff. So the shepherd's got to be close where he can help lead and guide. And mentors need to be able to come alongside others, modeling the behavior, values, and faith through sharing life together. It's not simply sprinting ahead in, in your walk with Christ and, and yelling down the, down the miles, hey, come up here to where I am. It's willing to understand where you're at in your spiritual walk, but then being willing to, to leave that spot to come to where they are, to come alongside them and bring them along in the way. People in general are longing for mentors. Don't believe me? Just look at who people are modeling. And because the church isn't being the model, where are they turning? They're turning to 
the media. They're turning to movies. Um, they're turning to popular personalities. And they model their lives after them rather than after Christ. When we don't find positive mentors in our lives, we will find the next best thing. And if we're not actively looking for mentors, I'll guarantee you this, the negative ones will usually find us. Robert Bly had said this, and I quote, A boy cannot become a man without the help of another man. Most ideally, a father, grandfather, uncle, or someone to whom he apprentices. We see this in our society. The people that are abused tend to grow up to be what? Abusers. Those who, do, who are raised violently have a tendency to act violently. We will model that, which is going before us. Let me ask you a question. Who are you going before? And what are you modeling spiritually for those people? Are you modeling Christ? Or are you modeling just select scriptures that you like? Or maybe a gospel that is just easier to swallow. God calls us to model his character to those that are around us so that then they will follow after that. Be someone that they can model. They are looking to you. Just as children. Have you ever noticed that when you raise children, they model you? And many times, what do they model? It's not the things you want them to model. They usually pick up on the things that you wish they wouldn't. And you know, it's the same in Christianity. What are you living before people? Are you living something right? Because I guarantee you, the, sm the things that are not right, they will grab, grab hold of. And they will model those. So we have to be very intentional about what we are showing to those around us. We need to understand that when we're fortunate enough to be surrounded by healthy, functional, caring, Firmly biblically founded people, we tend to become like them. However, if we're not surrounded by healthy, functional, caring people who follow the word but follow their own desires, we will follow them. Who are you? Who, who's following you? Because understand, there's going to come a day when we will stand before God, and I don't say this to cast fear uh, in people, but I think maybe sometimes maybe we need a little bit. Understand that when you stand before God, God's going to hold you accountable and responsible for those that look to your life to reflect Christ. And how well are you reflecting him? 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16 says this, Even though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I became your father through the gospel. Therefore I urge you to imitate me. So, five, so um, excuse me, six chapters before this, he also was mentioning, please imitate me. Imitate the Christ you see in me. Philippians chapter 3, verse 17 says this, Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. And yes, these are all written by Paul. And this passage in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, this even become imitators, actually means to mimic me. You, you might remember, you know, having that brother or that sister or that friend when you would do something and, and they would do it. And then you'd say, stop that. And then they'd say, stop that. And how irritating that would be. But this is literally what Paul's talking about. Imitate me to this point. Act like me. Be like me. Paul is asking these people to adopt all his ways He's as they follow Christ. He's asking them to conform to his lifestyle and persona. He's asking them to stick to him, to watch him, to follow him. He's asking them to be led by him, to follow his path. He's bold enough and confident enough to feel like it, he can tell them that and that they will be led rightly. Let me ask you a question. Do you feel you could say that to your neighbor on your street? To follow me, to mimic me, follow my life, follow my persona. And as you look at them, would you see Christ as they have followed you? 
Or do they look, would they look a lot less like him? Paul was encouraging them to walk the way that he does, talk the way he does, smile the way he does, think the way he does, act the way he does. Be trained by how I live my life. Take every aspect of me and walk in accordance with it as it models Christ. Be a living illustration of the life that I am living, is what he's claiming, telling them to do. Follow my pattern. Now, is he being a prideful jerk in all of this? No, not at all. All of us ex are examples, whether we want to be or not. We are examples to the world and to those people who are not, haven't walked with God maybe as long as we have. So how well are we modeling? Think about the situation here that Paul's addressing. He's talking to people. He's talking to Gentile people. People who hadn't been brought up in the ways uh, that the Israelites had been brought up. They didn't grow up in Christian families. And so what framework did they have to follow? What, what, what mindset did they have to, to stack up against this? Paul was probably it. Paul was the closest physical example they had. Jesus had already gone home to be with the Father. They couldn't follow him. And so Paul was there. So he's saying, as I'm seeking to live my life after Christ, you seek to follow me. Because we understand that Paul himself wasn't always at that point. When he first came to Christ, when he was converted there on the road to Damascus, he did not preach for three years. All he did is he sat underneath the apostles' teachings, those that had walked with Jesus, because Jesus had already died and gone to heaven when Paul had his Damascus experience. The, the ones that walked with him would have been the eleven. Because Judas at this point already hung himself. And so Paul hung out with them. He modeled his life after what he saw in them and what the words that they were teaching him about the life that Christ lived. As, and as he began to understand who Christ was and, and how he lived his life, and as he saw that lived out in the, the apostles, he fashioned his life accordingly. And now he's able to tell them, now you follow me as I'm following Christ. He is not so much calling them to mimic him, but the Christ that they see in him. And he's making sure that what he's reflecting is Christ. Let, let me ask you this question. Do people see enough of Christ in you that they can take a look and, and see, okay, yeah, okay, the, I understand this part isn't Christ, but this part is. But does the Christ part far outweigh the other part? Or, or in their trying to live their lives, uh, they're trying to follow um, Christ as they follow you. Is it more like panning for gold? Where really what they pick up is a whole lot more dirt and they've got to sift all that out to find those little itty bitty nuggets of Jesus. That's not the way God wants us to live. He wants us to live where they see him and understand, okay, yeah, this part over here, that, that, that's the you part. Let, let's get rid of that. But the vast majority of what they see is Jesus. These Christians are new to the faith. They have very few examples to follow. But Paul is here for them to follow. And although some of the Corinthians do not think highly of him, right? Go all the way back to chapter 1, where we had talked about that. Right? Some followed Apollo, some followed Cephas, some followed Paul. Not everybody was in his corner. But Paul said they should follow, all of them should follow his example in life. And he was telling them, don't look to me. Look to the Jesus in me. And, and I think that we could even dare say that what he's saying there is and that part about Cephas or that part about Apollos, the only thing you should be following there is the Jesus you see in them. And I think that we, we wouldn't be sacrilegious to state that here. Christ is the important piece. But we all know you get people that are more do what I say, not as I do. Make sure you're not living that kind of hypocritical life. Our actions speak more loudly than our words ever could. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather see a ser sermon than hear one. And trust me, all of us are preaching sermons with our lives. 
The church is shouting today for godly men and godly women to serve as spiritual mentors. And when we, what we are teaches far more than what we say or where we go to church. And this truth that what we live preaches can work to bless the church, but also can live to harm the church, depending on the life that we live. And the church, capital C, I'm not talking about life on Maine, talk about the church universal, the way people perceive Christ and Christianity. We need to be intentional and we need to show others through our lives how to live godly. So how do we live out this mentorship? Well, first let me say this. Be winsome. Be winsome. See, winsome members are the kinds of people who make you want to be like them. Now, I'm not saying, again, to be, you know, that first type of imitator we were talking about, where you're being some sort of a counterfeit. You've got to be the real deal. People will see through the fake every time. But Paul strove, as we talked about last week, he strove to please all men. Not that he was a man pleaser, but he strove to identify with them wherever they were and to love them and to uh, pour into them and in so doing, gain favor with them. And that is what we need to do as mentors in their lives, is to be generally pleasing and engaging with people, according to Webster's Dictionary. Luke chapter 8, verse 42. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him because he was so winsome. They wanted to be around him. Do people want to be around you? Do, do, do they want to be in your company? Is there something about you that draws them? See, we've all had winsome members in our lives. And I know I've had some. Some are my family members, brothers, my, my parents. I've had personal spiritual leaders that have stepped up. I've had youth group uh, leaders. I, I've, I've had pastors in my lives. I've had home group leaders that have all spoken in my lives in very powerful ways. And I've even had those positional spiritual leaders, leaders that I've never met. People like Billy Graham or Chuck Swindoll or uh, Francis Chan or Charles Stanley, people that I've read, uh, you know, how God's worked in their lives that have helped mentor me in the faith. Okay? They attract you. There's something about them that draws you to them. But strong mentors also show us how to live. New Christians don't know how to act. They don't know what to do. Any more than a baby fresh out of the womb knows how to walk. They have to be taught a little bit, don't they? They have to be held by the hand as they begin to get the sturdiness in their feet before they're able to actually walk. Are we doing that with other people? See, following Jesus is enough. We've got to be living illustration. We've got to be engaged with them. Okay? The truth of the matter is, in our society that has gotten so far removed from God, we need more and more people in the church to step up to not only teach us the spiritual things, but just how even the Bible is lived out in our everyday lives. Showing us how to handle things in life, such as alcohol, or money, or stress, or temptation. How to share our faith, how to, how to manage our anger, how to show love and compassion and forgiveness, how to live uh, with disappointment when it comes, how to deal with grief, how to live out our spiritual giftings, all of these things. And this is, these are just things off, off the top that we can disciple people in. But we've got to show them how to live and faithful mentors will encourage, comfort, support, and challenge people. They'll encourage, comfort, support, and challenge to inspire hope and help people incorporate holiness into their own lives. Living such a life that people will be like, I want to be like that. I want to be able to live my life in that way. Even when the hard times come, I look to them and, and I see how they handle disappointment. I see how they handle discouragement. I see how they handle sickness. And you know, I want to be like that. I want to have a faith that strong. We want to draw them. What are you doing to draw people more and more towards Christ? 
Christ suffered for our sake to mentor us to the Father. Are we willing to suffer for the faith to mentor other people into a right relationship with God? 1 Peter 4.12 tells us this, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are now suffering as though something strange is happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when glory is revealed. And can I tell you where one of those glories is? It's when you come through and then you see a brother or sister going through a hard time and you're able to come alongside them and say, Hey, you know, I was where you are. But you know, I continue to trust God and know he proved himself faithful. I know he'll do it with you. Let's walk together. That's mentoring. That's imitating Christ. As we close, understand mentors have imperfections. You will not do it perfectly. God's not calling you so much to do it perfectly, but are you doing it consistently and are you continuing to grow in it? See, when sheep realize that their shepherds aren't perfect, the awareness can sometimes be painful. But in spite of that, even in your human imperfections, you can disciple people on how to deal with it in his grace. Good mentors know they're only shepherds, they're not saviors. They know that they're leaders and not lords. They know they're guides and not gods to people. How are you imitating Jesus? Do you have people in your lives that are showing you how to imitate Jesus? Are you surrounding yourself with those sorts of people? And who are you reflecting Jesus to? And what kind of Jesus are you reflecting to them? These are all questions we need to ask ourselves as believers if we're going to have a Christianity that is credible towards God and towards the world. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you today. That Lord, first of all, you're not calling us to a place of perfection, but a place of obedience. Help us, Lord, to know more and more and to be more faithful at living like you and mimicking you to our world around us so that they get a clear perception of who you are and the love you have for them. Thank you, God, for allowing us to be a part. And we give you honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming. And as you go through the rest of this Valentine's Day, make it your number one goal to make sure the world knows how much you love him. Thank you. God bless you.